Hey, what's up? Dave here and welcome to this module called Development System as part of week six of the Data Freelancer program on service delivery. So throughout this module, I am going to walk you through our entire development system that we currently use within Data Lumina to work on our data and AI projects. So this is the system that I have developed over the years to really streamline the development process, taking on multiple projects at the same time. And at the beginning of my freelance career, I noticed that I was constantly reinventing the wheel. So straight out of university, I had no experience with project management tools, project management philosophies. So every time I would start a project, I would kind of like based on the kind of project that it was, I would set up a folder structure. Sometimes I would work in all notebooks, sometimes I would write Python code and every time the structure and also the process would be different. And at some point this caused uh, a lot of issues, right? Because first of all, you have to reinvent the wheel every time, constantly thinking, how am I going to set things up properly? But then also, and this is more important, later when you start to want to reference old code from previous projects that you work on, it can quickly become a mess where you feel like, oh, what, what was this? What was this function? And how did this notebook work? So to avoid all of that, I'm going to present this development system for you. So throughout this video, we are going to first talk about the system overview. So what's it all about? What can you expect? And what are the different elements within the system? Then we're going to talk about folder templates, which I'm also going to share with you that you can copy for your projects. Then I'm going to walk you through my entire VS Code setup to really maximize my productivity when writing Python code. So I use VS Code for that. We're going to go through the setup. Then I'm going to introduce you to a ClickUp workflow that we use for our project management uh, workflows right now. And this is something I'm going to show you how to do it in ClickUp. I'm going to provide you with a template and also with some automations, but the general principles can be applied really in any project management tool. So if you're already familiar, let's say with either Jira or Trello, or you use Linear or some other kind of system, it will still work. And I just want to explain the, the thought process going to the thought process that we currently have in mind when we go about project management for our development projects. Then, Let's quickly talk about documentation. No one likes it, right? But we have to take care of our documentation as well, both internally for the project we were working on, but also externally to our clients. So we want to communicate sprint releases, uh, release notes, updates, all of the things that we have to keep track of and want to communicate. So quickly touch upon documentation. And then I'm going to provide you with our internal new project SOP. So our new project standard operating procedure. So whenever we sign a new contract, we have a new deal, we kick off this new project SOP, which is a list of, I believe, 16 action items that you have to take in order to be fully ready for the project. And then we'll conclude with some action items for you to go through so you can start to develop and implement your own development system. So this is going to be an exciting one. Let's dive into the system overview. So let's start with the goal. Why would you want a development system like this? Why should you implement something like this as a data professional? Well, the goal really is to have a well-defined development workflow that can be repeated for every new project, ensuring efficient operations, easy referencing to old projects and also improving the quality of your work. So these are essentially to tackle all of the problems that I just introduced to you. And I know for so many people, especially when you're new to working with data, when you're in university, you're just getting started. These are the kind of things that you that you ignore, right? You want to learn as much as possible and you quickly overlook this. And as a result, things can get messy real quickly, but especially also early on in the learning process and as you start to take on your first projects, it's really important to already train yourself to work like this. So it gets easier over time, you get used to it, but also just to learn from your old projects and being able to easily reference those. So that's the goal. That's why we're getting into this. And now as with all systems that I present within Data Freelancer, let's start with some principles. So these are some things that you have to keep in mind as you start to develop your own development system, because I'm going to show you mine, but there might be some elements to this that you want to change. You may want to use a different tool, different approach, but if you keep these principles in mind, then the tactics will come and you will figure out what's best for you. 
So we have seven principles and principle number one is simplicity. So keep the system straightforward and easy to navigate and manage. So again, you want to avoid like highly complex systems and very complex automations that break over time that you have to maintain. The simpler, the better. That said, it also, of course, it has got to be efficient. So you want to optimize your workflows and automate repetitive tasks to increase productivity and reduce manual processing time. But again, you want to avoid spending so much time on engineering the system that taking care of that takes more time than the actual work, right? Because this is kind of like a trap that we as developers tend to run into. I so many times have to say, oh, I can create this sick automation on this, but then I'm like, no, 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 this is going to take me hours. Keep it simple, focus on the work instead. Simplicity, efficiency. Also, make sure your system is cross-platform compatible, meaning that there is an interoperability across various tools and systems used by maybe some other data professionals that you are going to work with to facilitate collaboration and access from multiple devices and also operating systems. So maybe in the beginning, it's probably just, just you. It's just you who's working on these projects. But as you um, will grow into your career and also in your free, uh, as a freelancer, you will naturally start to work together with more people over time. And you want to keep this in mind so that the system does not become too rigid where only you can work with it. Future proofing is another one. So on one hand, you want to be kind of like flexible. Again, this goes back to don't be too rigid on building out very complex automations and custom code pieces and even templates that are very specific to a certain tool because these are going to change over time. So you want to keep it flexible and scalable and ensure that you can sustain this in the long term. And then principle number five is collaboration. So you want to foster a collaborative environment where team members can easily share and work together on projects. So even if it's just you in the beginning, you should already keep this in mind when designing it. Then number six, version control. So make sure, make, make, make sure you implement version control to keep track of changes and manage different iterations of, of data assets and code effectively. And then number seven, finally, is documentation. So you want to make sure at all times that within your system, in the, your development system, there's room and attention for documenting the process. So this could be, this could be processes, data sources, code transformations, Everything that is relevant for not only you to remind yourself of what it is that you worked on, because remember, likely the code that you will write today, next week, you probably already do not understand completely how it worked, right? So this is for you, but also for your team members and also for your clients and potentially other stakeholders that you have to collaborate with. So those are the principles going into the system. And then let's look at the key elements that we are going to cover in this video as well. So we're going to look at folder templates, uh, we're going to look at the code editor, environments, project management tools, version control, documentation, SOPs, and team communications. So if you take care of all of these elements, then you have a solid development system, a solid development workflow. All right, so that was the overview. Now, first, let's get into the folder templates. And for this, I'm going to provide you with two templates that we are currently using. But first, let's quickly zoom out a little bit again and reference the digital information system architecture that I shared with you in the previous module. So again, we talked about where we place these projects, right? So whenever I start a new project following the para method, I have a project folder where I create a new folder and store the project information. But then we also talked about how I have a separate folder where I store my project repositories because they can get messed up if you sync them to the cloud and work together with multiple people. So that's why we have separate templates for all of those. So a main project folder, but also the actual repositories that I use for my data and AI projects. And I have two that I use. So one is a data science template which is based on the cookie cutter data science template. So I will link all of these for you to reference, but if you wanna learn more about this specific directory structure, then you can check out this, pa this, this page over here. This is just overall a very nice setup for data science projects. I made it a little simpler. So the original one is a little bit more extensive. So I removed some of the elements that I don't use. Let's come back over here. And we also have a general repository template. 
And this is the template that I use for most general projects and also all of the AI projects that I'm currently working on. But for example, you can see the data science one is a little bit more extensive with notebooks, references, models. Um, on the data side of things, we have different levels of data that we can work with. So these are all things that are very common in data science projects. Whereas, for example, if I'm working on a Gen AI project, I fo just fo we focus on the code. We might have some reports and some docs in there and maybe some images that we put in there as well. And that's about it. So that's the starting point. So those are the templates that we use. And let's come back to the folder templates over here. So I'm going to share these with you. They're also part of the Data Lumina GitHub repository that you all have access to where you can find more of the automations and also the shared project library that we have, but you can also find these repositories. Now, what you can do is you can either download these and store them, for example, to your local drive. And then whenever you start a new project, you just create a duplicate of it. Or what you can also do, you can create or put them into GitHub and use them as a template repository. So I will show you later how to do that, how you can go about that. But those are kind of like the two ways to, that you can work with that. And at least make sure that you also include a default .git ignore in, in all of your repositories. So within these repositories, you can see the git ignore is already in here. And I've excluded most of the stuff that you will encounter working on data projects and AI projects that you don't want to end up in your version control. So uh, specifically, these are your, your .env files, for example, uh, which are over here. So, and also just general data and logs that you don't want to end up in here. So this keeps your uh, repository nice and clean. So that is what I wanted to cover on folder templates and the two main templates that we use right now. And this is really the first step within our development system after we land a new project. We're going to set the project up based on a folder template. Now, I invite you to do something similar, figure out for your work, what is a template that you can use? So you have it ready for easy access. Again, we will bring all of this together in the new project SOP where you have an outline of all of the steps that you have to take, but this is the first one. Now, next, we are going to dive into the code editor and I use VS Code. So I'm going to show you a setup that I use within VS Code to make my work in there much more fun and also much more productive and efficient. So I'm going to show you how I've set it up in six steps, actually. Focusing first on the basics, some extensions, and then showing you how to actually work with this. So you can draw some inspiration from this. I recommend copying the setup because I haven't really found any like faster, faster way to, to work on data and AI projects than this. So this is going to be really exciting. So first let's open up VS Code and I have a demo project over here that we're going to use as an example. So the first thing that you want to do, so if you don't have VS Code already, I recommend to install it and give it a try. Just do a quick Google search for VS Code and you will find it. So step one, setting up the workspace. So the first thing that you want to do is you want to create a new project on your local drive and then use a duplicate of the folder template. So you now know the folder templates, what they're about. So I'm going to show you, so I have the YouTube repositories over here, which I use for all of my YouTube projects. And in here we have a demo project. And here you can see that we've copied the data science project template that I just shared with you. So that is the first step and that is how I would set up a project. I have a separate uh, repositories folder that you can see that is on my Dropbox, on Data Lumina's Dropbox, but then in my private folder over here where all the projects uh, are that I'm working on for my clients. And this is a separate one that I use for YouTube and that I'm gonna use for the demo. So you are going to create a folder and then you are going to open up that folder. So let me show you if you are new to that. So you're going to open up that folder in Fiasco. So you can go to file, then open folder, and then you should have that folder, the demo project within Fiasco. Now, the next thing that you want to do is you want to save as a workspace. Now, I already did this, so it's already uh, in here. So within the demo project folder, you then create a demo project.code dash workspace. Now, automatically the project, the uh, workspace project gets the same name as the folder. And this is what I would recommend just for, for e easy reference. So you can see in here, we have the workspace. And now let's say if I close out VS Code, what is nice is now from here, 
I can just open up this project and I'm back into it. So this just allows you to easily pick up projects where you left off uh, continuing from there. So that's step one and how you go about setting up a workspace within VS Code for your project. Now, then we have the extensions that I use. So VS Code, what I really like about VS Code is that it's so extensible. So out of the box, it's a solid code editor. But really, if we want to make it effective for working on data and AI projects, we actually have to install a bunch of extensions. And here are all the extensions that I use. So let me quickly show you how you can install these extensions. And then I will just one by one quickly give my comments about it and tell you why I use it. But let's start with the first one. It's probably the most important one. It's the Python extension pack. So if I come in here in VS Code, let me see, can you actually see this? Yes. And come in here, Python extension pack. I can already also actually do it like this so you can see it a little bit better. I can just come in here, extensions. It's this puzzle icon over here. And then I can search. And here you can see Python extensions pack. And what's nice about this one is that it's actually a pack consisting of seven extensions in one, which are all really helpful for writing Python code and thus working on data and AI projects. So this is a cool one. And you, if right now, for me, you see disable, but for you, if you're new, you should see install. Look, here you see install. So this would be another one. So that is what you would click on. And then in a matter of seconds, it will install it into your workspace. So that's how you install extensions. And now let's quickly go over everything that I have. So starting with the extension pack, we have the auto doc string, which is helpful for generating docs within functions, for example, in classes. We in general just have Python to work with the Python language. Then we have some AI assistant development, which is default in here, but actually I am overwriting this with um, GitHub Copilot. Then we have Python indents, which correct Python indentation. Python is, can be really weird about using spaces or tabs. So this just takes care of that. And we also have a Python environment manager where we can either use Conda environments or virtual environments to keep, keep our uh, working environments isolated. And also comes with uh, a Django extension, which uh, is, could be useful if you work on Django projects. So then next on the list is Path IntelliSense. And this is, for example, when you are linking to data paths or uh, within your code. So let's say you want to load a data set. This allows you to um, browse through your path. So if you do a path and then, for example, you do a dash, then Path IntelliSense will automatically read through your directory. You can just autocomplete. So it just makes that process easier. Then we have Black Formatter, which is the, the code formatter that I use. So um, really quick example on how this works. If you have Black installed, this is really awesome. And for example, you, your, um, your code is not automatically, or I should say not um, form, formatted according to the standards that you have to find. So it's a little, this, this list, for example, is a little messy. And maybe let's say I do it like this. And now what I can do if I hit command S to save, boom, it will automatically ref, uh, reformat this. And this will really ensure that you have a very consistent look and feel to your code, always following best practices. So you can just kind of like create working but messy code. And then upon saving, Black will take care of that. So that's also an extension that we can install. And there's later in the settings, one more tweak that we have to do in order to make it default upon, save, upon saving. But here you can see it's just an extension, black formatter, this is the one. So that's why I like to use black. Then we have Jupyter for running Jupyter notebooks. Then I have a bunch of GitHub extensions. So I've used pull requests to create pull requests. Actions to monitor actions, GitHub Copilot, which requires a separate subscription, but is really awesome. So this is uh, an AI auto completion. You're probably already familiar with this. They also have Copilot Chat, which is a separate extension, but it's the same subscription. So this allows you to like come in here, for example, make data set. And so let's select this and then we have the data. And then let's say add a new column job to the data as well. Let's see if this works. Accept, and here you can see it now plugged that in. So this was a very 
simple example, but you can also do this with complex exam examples. So that is chatting with GoPilot, but it also allows for autocomplete. So for example, if I now do DF, it always starts to like recommend what it is that I wanna do. And it's going to provide auto suggestions. So this overall for your development workflow is very solid. So on the one hand, asking questions that you would normally hop over to ChatGPT with, and on the other hand, auto completions and suggestions already while you're coding. So I absolutely love working with GitHub Copilot. Then I have better comments as well, which is something you can look into. And then I have two styling extensions. One is uh, for the overall team. So I use the Atom One Dark team, which I will show you how to set up next. And then I use the material icon team, which are the icons that you, let's see, you see over here. And I also, this, but this is based on my personal preference, I have lots of Azure extensions. So for all of most of the common Azure resources that I use. But as like a base, like cookie cutter for you to get started, I would focus on these extensions uh, where GitHub Copilot is optional because it requires a separate subscription. All the other ones are just free and I would recommend to play with. So then step three, styling VS Code. And again, this is all stuff that you have to set up once. You can, let's come over here. Uh, let's see, yeah, you can see this. I can click here on the gear icon and you have teams and we have color team. And this is where I use Atom One Dark. So that is the one that you're seeing right now, but you can select different ones based on your preferences. Also maybe browse other ones through the extensions. And we also have Teams file icon team where I use the material icon team, which just gives these nice um, icons to all of these separate folders automatically. So these, these colors are just based on the name. So data, it understands that it makes that yellow and it adds this little database icon. And that's just really for easy reference. So my eyes are kind of like visually trained as well to know models, red, data, yellow, top, etc. So that just helps as well. So that's styling. And then let's look at some settings where we are going to change two settings. Everything else is just default that I use and something you should know about settings. So if I come over here, one thing that you'll notice is that you can change settings at the user level and the workspace level. And user level is like top level for all of your projects and workspace settings is for this project specifically. So if for whatever reason you want to change something specifically for this project, but then when you close VS Code and open up a new instant, you don't want it, you can use workspace settings. And workspace settings also does overwrite the user level. I never mess with that. I do everything at the user level because I want to have a consistent uh, development workflow. Then what you want to do, so there are two settings that I change. Um, one is Jupyter Interactive Window. So if I come in here and say search for Jupyter Interactive Window, here you can see Jupyter Interactive Window Text Editor Execute Selection. And you want to make sure that, or want to make sure, if you prefer this, I highly recommend you check this box. And this is what it does. When pressing Shift Enter, send selected code in Python file to a Jupyter interactive window as opposed to the Python terminal. And this has completely changed the game for me in terms of my productivity in my Python workflow. And I've shared this multiple times already on YouTube as well. And people absolutely love this. It's a complete game changer. And here's what it does. I can just browse, I can just scroll essentially through the code, select certain lines and then hit shift enter. And then an interactive session will open up similar to how you would work with a Jupyter notebook. So I can come in here and essentially execute the code line by line. But what makes it very effective is that I can come in here, for example, so this is all just keyboard. I don't touch the mouse. I can come in here and then for example, hit option shift and right arrow to select only data, hit shift enter, and I can just plot the data. Versus if I were to use a Jupyter notebook or a send it to the terminal, if I wanted to see the outcome of the data, I would first have to do a print statement. So I would have to do print data, then run that. Uh, so this is of course not correct. It's not the variable, but you get what I'm saying. And also when you work with Jupyter notebooks, for example, you constantly, if I now, let's say, want to show what data actually is within this notebook, so I can come in here, let's say data, and I want to see what is data. Then I have to come in here, click B, and then add a column, 
or new row and then run this again and then oh this is the data but now i actually don't need it anymore so i can get rid of it and it's just it gets messy and let's not save this and this literally what i was just showing showing, uh, showing you using notebooks this is how i would run python code and do data and ai, AI projects for like first of all throughout all of university so throughout like the six years of university and then probably also one year into my actual career this is how I was doing this and then all of a sudden I learned this trick and it completely changed everything and once you build kind of like a muscle for this like bra sn snapping through the code and just making quick selections and then do you either like print this print that or do it separate and then look at only what data frame is this just changes everything and really when you start to like build up your uh, your line by line code as well. So let's say we want to have only the H series so we can see, okay, is this the right column? Yes, it's the right column. But now let's see what if you only want H, the data where H is higher than 35. We can have a look at this. Okay, that looks good. And then we save it top level at like the whole row by just having our cursor on there. So that's how it is. If you have your cursor on the line, hit shift enter. It runs the whole line. If you select certain things, it will execute just that code. I know, complete game changer. So that is the first setting that I change and always leave on. And the second one is, let's come back over here because it's kind of like annoying. You can also manually find it, but this is how we set the default formatter for the Python language to the black formatter. So you can come in here and copy this as well, or you can search for it, but I find this easier. Come in here, settings, search for this. And here you can see we have the default formatter, but then specifically for Python code. And here you see there is a bunch of stuff that you can pick from, but if you have the black extension installed, you should be able to select black formatter here. And again, this allows you to, if you, let's say, let's mess this up here. It will just, I hit command S and it just resets this. In the beginning, it can be uh, it can take some time to get a little used to this because sometimes the code it like it reformats can look a little weird because it adheres to a certain like line length, but you get used to it and over time it becomes so effortless to work with because all your code looks the same. And black is also the formatter that they're using at Facebook actually or used to maybe they switch, but this is also something that the big guys are doing. This is not something I invented, so. Um, that's why when I heard that I was like, okay, this is also something that I want to do. And I've been using it for two years, I think already now and haven't looked back and you set it once and then you can just forget about it because it works for all your other projects as well. Okay. So those are some settings that I tweak within VS code. And then I've already showed you how to do this. So within VS code, you can also run notebooks similar to how you normally run notebooks. And you can run Python code using the interactive sessions. This is what I always do. One quick note on that, it doesn't work with async functions. So if you're working on, let's say, AI projects and you're building some apps where there's some async, uh, async stuff in there, the interactive session does not really work like that. Or when you run servers, for example, when you want to run a Flask app or Fast API, that is where you would come in here and just hit run Python code, where you would send it to the terminal. So you can see there, it just sends it to the terminal. So that's just something to keep in mind. All right, so that's the part on setting up and managing VS Code. That's, that those are all the tweaks that I have made. Then now let's get into the ClickUp workflow that I use. And now again, I use ClickUp to handle all our development tasks at DataLumina. Uh, I suggest you follow my lead because I'll share templates and automations uh, made just for this method. And by now you've already probably looked into ClickUp because I've shared it multiple times throughout the course. But if you prefer, you can set up a similar system with tools like Linear, which is also really awesome. I love Linear, but again, it's very isolated, only really solid for development. Uh, you can look at Trello, Jira, Todoist. All of those tools allow you to do something similar. And good to note, because I love Linear so much, what, what I've essentially did is I recreated the entire Linear pro process within ClickUp, also with all of the automations. So I'm following the Linear philosophy and, and best practices. So let's have a look actually at what a project within ClickUp looks like. Now, 
ClickUp is highly customizable. You can create lists, you can create boards, you can create timelines, you can do whatever. But at the basis, I like to work with a Kanban overview. So that's what you see over here, Kanban board setup. Now, this depends on per personal preference, but overall, most software development, project management systems have some kind of like a Kanban board setup because it's just very visual for everyone in the team to just get an instant like bird's eye view backlog what's to do what's in progress what's in review what's done so those are also the categories that i use so again in clickup you can you can design this completely how you want you can have two you can have two statuses two kind of like buckets where you can put things into or you can have 100 i have no idea why you would use that much but you can set it up the way you like i have copied these from linear this is how they do it in linear and they tend to work really well for the work that we do so Keep it simple, uh, focus on the essentials. And those are the kind of like statuses that we put into here. Now, these you can copy and recreate in other tools as well. But this is how we have set it up. Now, um, one thing to note, I'm going to share, scrolling down a little bit, I'm going to share our Data Lumina project template with you that we will use for our development projects. So if you use ClickUp and you follow this URL, you can create an instant copy of what you see here, even with the automations in there and also all of the tags that we can add. So that is something to, to keep in mind as I show you all of this. So we also have some feature labels. So let me come in here and this is, for example, let's say I come in here and here you have a label and this is something you can add. So let's say you want to work on a new feature we can first decide like, what is it? Is this a bug that we're trying to fix? Is this an improvement? Is this documentation that we have to work on a test, etc. So those, this is kind of like the second category that we add to our feature. So they have a status and they also have a label. And now let's talk about the ClickUp and GitHub integration. And this is where it gets really cool and where we can emulate some of the stuff that linear out of the box almost does pretty well. So in order to do this, um, you have to follow two steps. So you first, you have to set up the integration and then you can look at the automation. So ha let's have a quick look at this. And this is something I am not going to completely show you how to do right now because all of the steps are here and it's pretty self-explanatory. Just read the documentation careful, carefully and it will show you how you can sync your ClickUp workspace with GitHub. So essentially, you'll end up with a, a GitHub synchronization to your uh, repositories and your organizations. Then next, what you need, coming back, you have to set up the initial automations. So that is another doc for you to go through using the, you should first set it up, then have the um, int integration, and then you can set up automations. And that is something that I will show you how to do. They're also already in the ClickUp template that I'm going to share with you. So the automations are in here, but I'm not sure what will happen if you clone the project first before setting up the integration. So you might have to do some manual things in here, but it's not that complicated. Usually one time like setup. But this is where it gets really cool because here is where we can leverage these automations to sync essentially the work that we do here within ClickUp with the stuff that, that we do on GitHub. And then also one thing that I like to do is setting up Slack notifications. So here's another URL for you to go through where you can uh, see how you can set this up. And this is something that I'm going to show you because for this new demo project, I kind of like want to show you the full pipeline. So I'm going to show that to you now. So let's come over here. Let's go to the App Center, which is here in the corner. Go to the App Center. There we have Slack and then we have, and then we can click on Manage over here. So here's the Slack integration and there's some documentation on there, but we are going to add a new notification. And then we are going to select in Solutions Demo. So this is the demo project that we're working on. And then I'm also going to select our demo project repository or demo project channel, I should say. This is in Slack. So you should actually have that in Slack enabled. And then I come in here and then what we're going to do, uh, we can click on Manage. And here you can see the type of notifications that you uh, want to be notified of in Slack. And I am going to leave those with the default. 
So let's come out over here. So that is how you set up the Slack integration. Let's come back to the documents. So first GitHub, then Slack. And then if you have set those up, then now would be the good time to come in here and to click on the Data Lumina uh, template, the project template that we've created. And now what you can do, you can see you can add it to a certain workspace. So this will be your workspace if you open it up. Then you can give it a name. So what uh, is recommended is that you first store this maybe as a template repository or template project within your own ClickUp and then later for new projects, create a duplicate of that. But that's really up to you. And then you can create a space. So let's say again, we come to solutions and we create the demo folder and we want to use the template. And here you can also save a copy of this template to my workspace and share with someone. So for, for later for easy reference. But for now, I'm going to use this template and now if we wait a little bit, it will click up, will set things up and there we go. And now here you can see that, uh, let's see, we come over here. We have the data Lumina project template and currently it's empty, but we have everything that we need. So we have the, with the list view, we have the board view with all of the colors that we've adjusted and also all of the statuses. We have even a timeline view in here filtered by that, that we can group by all of the labels. And now you can just come in here and say like, hey, feature one that I'm going to work on. And now you can also say, hey, this is actually, uh, this is a feature that we're going to work on. And let's say we're going to work on that from today all the way till uh, the 25th. So say, let's say due date. So we have start date, 25, 22 to 25. Okay, now let's see, let's come in here. Timeline view. Look, we actually have the feature in here which we now, if you, for example, move it to to do or in progress, it will show up in here over time. Uh, it will have the color of the status and it will be grouped by uh, the actual label. And this is all stuff that you can customize, but this is what we use and what works really well for us right now. And ClickUp even has very advanced features where you, for example, get into a Gaunt view and you can also come in here, let's say we have another feature. So feature two, which is actually is not in progress. That is on the to do. And that is actually blocked by, let's see, feature two, where is it? So that should be, then we plug that in. So let's say feature two, we're going to work on that next week. But then there's a dependency over here where first we have to complete feature one before we can work on feature two. And that is reflected in a relationship where it's blocking. So feature one is actually blocking feature two. So this is really where you can get into some advanced planning that might not be necessary for most development projects. But as you start to grow and you start to work together with more people, this is where you can emulate features that are also available in Jira, for example, and other popular software development tools uh, and project management tools. So here you can, see it also indicates that there is kind of like a dependency over here. So there's really a lot that you can do with ClickUp. It's a very powerful tool, but now let's show you one more thing about the automations. And then in a bit, I can show you how we can bring all of this together. So I'm going back to my demo project where we already have some, some features in here. And if I now come over here to automations, these are the two automations that I like to set up. So when pull request merge in GitHub, then status change. And what you wanna do is you wanna sync it to the repo. So through the integrations, you can give uh, access to a certain set of repos and the demo project is in here. And here is kind of like the, the flow that I would like to follow. So it starts with a branch that is linked and then we apply a status change from, uh, we change the status to in progress. So this is going to be really exciting. As you start to work on new features, they are going to automatically move forward within the Kanban board. And this is just so nice because as a developer, you just wanna focus on the code and ideally you wanna minimize opening up other tools, right? So you don't wanna, what you don't want is just a good day of, of coding, you're working on stuff and then, oh shit, I have to do the admin, right? I have to keep track of everything. What did I worked on? That, that stuff is already in GitHub, right? So we just wanna leverage that. And these are the two automations that we can use for that. And you can uh, create a lot more here, be creative, but at the core, these work really well. So this is the one to move it to in progress whenever a branch is linked. 
And again, I will show this in a bit about how this works. Also with the Slack notification, how everything comes together. And then also we have the pull request merge, which will put it to, or put the status to done. And this is how we can move through the pipeline. So coming back to the document, we covered a lot actually already. Um, then one more step. So features, what kind of features do you put onto the board? How do you go about that? Well, uh, after creating the project, so you want to fill in these initial features and you can start by listing all the features here that you included in the proposal that you shared with your client, which you covered in the proposal formula in week four. Now, if you're working with a team, it's important to clearly describe each feature and also define a definition of done. So don't just come in here and say build feature four or build data pipeline, whatever. If it's just you and you understand what you mean with that feature, then that's of course okay. But nonetheless, it, it's good practice to get into the habit of being clear about this. So clearly describe what is this feature about and when is it done? So this is how you start with the features and then you can just fill in as much details as possible, right? So maybe you can, for example, um, add t assign it to team members. You can assign the dates. Maybe you can add other views to this. So maybe you can track even a workload, which is, I haven't even looked into that activity, uh, gun charts, timelines, calendars. So you can do very exciting stuff all here from within ClickUp. But now let's look at bringing this, bringing everything together here and actually working on the features. So here's kind of like the uh, action plan for that. And before we get into this, one more thing that I would like to show you, because if you open up a feature, for example, over here, you can see that the features in my workspace are numbered starting with def, and then they have a number. Now, by default, ClickUp will use a random kind of like number code for this. And there's a quick little setup that you can do that I recommend. And that is at the space level. So here at the solutions level in Data Lumina, I can come to space settings and then customize task ideas. So here you can see there's a custom prefix. So you can have separate, separate tasks for sales, dev, design, and I recommend just doing it with dev. So um, it's just easier to refer to instead of having these all of these random codes. Because we are going to use these to actually use as our feature branches, as our names, and also within PRs to sync all of this up. That is what the, the integration is for. So if we now open up our project and we make sure that uh, the project is already linked to the repository, so we can come in here, for example, click on this. So we have the sync. So here we have the demo project. It's already synced and we have the ClickUp set up as well. What we can now do, let's say if we come to the Kanban board, to the sprint board, and we want to work on feature two, build feature two. I can come in here and I can now come over here to the GitHub icon and I can here copy the branch name and I can even say create and check out a new branch name. So I can just come in here, copy this, come over to my project and then just open up a new terminal. And then I can just say git checkout and then it can it follows this um, this naming convention over here, which you can customize, but I've set it up to follow my name, then the feature, and then uh, or the feature ID, and then the name of the feature. So I can do this, and you can see that I'm now on a new feature, and now I can actually uh, first of all I can publish this feature. So I can come in here and maybe say like, hey, we or for example, let's say I want to add some code here as well. So let's say I do some initial code, I put it in here, I start to work on the feature and now it's uh, about to publish it. So I'm going to commit and push and then GitHub uh, is going to ask, hey, the branch is not pushed yet. Would you like to push? Let's say, OK. And now we're going to push that and let's say don't show again. And now let's see the magic happen. So we first get some notifications over here. First from Slack that the build feature two is the status change from to do to in progress. So this is very cool for team updates and you don't have to do anything about this. And I can also come in here and you can see that build feature two is now in progress. So this is so cool when working on this. And now I can just as a developer work on my feature. Maybe let's say, okay, this is uh, something that we don't want. And then all of a sudden, now I feel like, okay, this feature is actually completed. So I'm going to commit and push this one more time. And now I'm actually ready to create a pull request. 
So we can actually do this from GitHub as well, or go over here and let's see, come over here to the actual GitHub repository. So you can do this in multiple ways, but I just come over here to GitHub, let's say compare and pull request. Then I'm going to create one and I'm going to uh, merge this into the main. So let's say I worked on the, on the feature, we completed it and now it's ready to be merged. And now we have the whole review process and we can merge the pull request and confirm it. And the nice thing about this is that you, in doing so, you work in a very systematic manner. And I know here we get the, uh, here we get the notifications again. So you can decide, hey, do you want to leave also the ClickUp notifications on or only on Slack? And here you can see even it copies the colors. So to me, this is so exciting. And this is based on essentially the 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 workflow that um, that is default for linear for the project management tool and in doing so you create such a nice trace of all the projects that you worked on so are the features that you worked on so now you can see build feature 2 is here and i can come in here and also just see all of the branches that are linked to here and just i can now come in here and references reference everything that we did so what are the commits so we did refactoring, etc. This is what we removed. And then we added all of this code. And I just have that here from within ClickUp. And this is just such a cool tool. And again, maybe if you're just starting out and it's just you, you might feel like, hmm, I don't know, this is a little bit of an overkill. But if you already train yourself to work like this, and I know this is more common to like software engineers, but we as data professionals, we usually overlook this part because we never get formal training on this. But this is how you run software development projects. And especially if you work on AI projects, this becomes like really important to manage all of this. And I found this to be the most effective uh, setup, leveraging automations with a GitHub integration to just actively work uh, or to, to just effortlessly work on your projects. And now one thing to wrap up. So after you merge, it's also good practice to delete the old branches. So here you can just delete the branch. And then also here we can now come over here and just use uh, GitHub to, or the GitHub extension to come in here. And now let's say we want to check out the main, we want to sync it. So now we have all of the code from the main in here. And what we can then also do is we can come over to branch, let's say delete branch and also remove it locally. So now everything is cleaned up again and we're ready to take on the next feature. So let's say we want to fix a bug, come in here, check out, and we follow a similar process. We get to work again. And that's how we currently work with ClickUp inside of Data Lumina to manage our data and AI projects. So it's a lot, I know, a lot to, to get through, but I wanna show you the entire setup. Uh, but that covers the ClickUp workflow for now. So let's see, what do we have left? We have documentation. So let's talk about that next. And for the documentation part, we have kind of like the philosophy and the process that we use currently. We have some examples, some principles, and I'm also going to share some release notes um, examples with you that we recently shared with a client of ours to wrap up a sprint, but we have anonymized everything um, so we can share it with you. So when it comes to documentation, we follow a structured process or, or approach to managing our documentation to ensure efficiency, accessibility, and we keep all our documentation mainly centralized by storing it in a project repository reports or docs folder. So if I come over here, so this is the extensive one here, we have the docs and we have reports, for example, we like to use markdown files and keep them within the project repository. Because if you have them somewhere else, for example, in ClickUp, which where you can also store excellent documentation, you create kind of like a disconnect where when possible, we like to keep it at the repository and in markdown. So we can leverage also the version control over there. And then we just create subfolders for maybe some research that we do, some sprint release notes and other relevant categories. And whenever we want to share these, we usually export them as PDF. So this is where ClickUp can come in handy because it supports Markdown. So you can just paste the Markdown in here and then for example, maybe style it, style it a little bit better and then maybe share either a branded doc via link or you create the PDF expert. Okay, and then diagrams. So this is also something just 
to keep in mind when creating documentation. Whenever possible, we try to create diagrams to visually illustrate aspects of the project. So this could be the architecture, data pipeline, or some kind of like agent flows that we're building. We're using Figma for this. So here's an example that we recently created. So this was, kind of, it was a data pipeline that we used to process some, Google, some CSV records from Google Sheets, turn them into CSVs put them into a storage account and then via webhook sync them with uh, a PG vector extension within an Azure PostgreSQL database used as our vector database for uh, retrieval augmented generation. All right, and then some principles to keep in mind when working on documentation. So clarity is key, use simple language, short sentences should be easy to understand. No one likes reading documentation, so it should serve a purpose, keep it clear. This is not like your high school essay where you have to reach 20 pages. <laughs> and also you want to be concise. So only really include the necessary information. Kind of goes hand in hand. Keep it short, concise. Then regular updates. So don't wait until the end of the project to start working on your documentation. And I have definitely been guilty for this. Still do sometimes to this day. But do as I say, not as I do. So of course you want to focus on regular updates just keep things up to date so it's not this like big task at the end use visuals like i've said to illustrate the process so review and edit also like if you're sharing stuff with clients just just do a quick review use a spell checker etc and use templates for consistency so have uh, kind of like a general way that you write for example your your sprint documentation or your release notes and this just helps to speed up the process and also shows just a sense of professionalism when you communicate with your clients and leverage AI here. So this is, AI is so good for this because the thing is with documentation, it doesn't matter if the client can sense that this is all AI generated. Because the thing is, if it, it just has to be clear. So you could just very well come into here and just plug it into ChatGPT and ask or into ClickUp and just say, write, a doc write documentation about this. So this is what we do, it works really well. Um, and then some example release notes. So you can refer to these notes from a recent sprint that we worked on. If you work with sprints, this is a format that is very uh, effectively at communicating the progress and outcomes to the team and stakeholders, but you can adjust the structure to fit your project needs and development cycles. So how you document depends on how you structure your projects, also the projects that you work on and what clients want. But as a general like rule of thumb, you can look at this. So here's, like I've said, a recent project. We start with an introduction. Then these were the features that we're going to work on. And then for every feature, we just have some simple explanations of what it is that we worked on. And then along the way, we found some bug fixes and also some updates that we also improved that were not part of really the scope of the sprint in terms of features, but we encountered them along the way. So you can use this as an example. And then let me see, I'm not sure if, if this actually works, but this is then how you would do it. So for example, you come in here, reports, new file, and let's say you have like sprint3.md, you come in here and then, okay, so it's not markdown compatible right now, but here you get the point. So that is how we go about the technical documentation for the projects that we work on. Now for some project, we also create dedicated PowerPoint presentations, which Kristen uh, is in charge of, but that's out of the scope for this video. This is more related to the technical docs that you use to keep everyone on the same page internally, both yourself to understand the code and communicate to your clients. Okay, I know we've covered a lot. Uh, this is the last section that we are going to cover in this video, and that is the new project SOP. And this is essentially all kind of like a summary of what we've been working on. And this is what we currently use at Data Lumina. So this is the exact like process that I go through whenever we start with a new project to make sure we check off all the boxes and we have everything in place. So it includes everything that we covered within this video. Um, there are some, some little additional things that you can do. So for example, we have storing API keys and other credentials, let's say in, in one password and setting them maybe up in your .env files in your project actually. So coming in, in here, I'm not sure if, it, if it's in here, the env file, okay, so it's not in here. So maybe you have, you wanna have some API credentials, you wanna plug them in here. So API is etc. 
So that, that is stuff that is also in here in like the setup. And I also use one password to safely store all of that information and also maybe share it with other team members. And as part of this process, we usually also create a virtual environment for our Python environment. So I always use Conda, but you can also use virtual env. So this is kind of like up to you. Um, but the goal is to show you this project SOP, which you can, you can du duplicate and create a copy of top right corner over here. But you want to update this um, ideally to fit your exact workflow. So that's kind of like the goal of showing you this. So this is our entire setup. And now after going through this video and after seeing all of this, learning all of this, to wrap this up, here are kind of like the action items for you to get started with. So you should brainstorm and design your own development system based on the lessons shared in this module. So look at the work that you do. So whether that's data engineering, data science, AI, analytics, a combination of all of that, software engineering, you should figure out what kind of templates, what kind of environments, what kind of languages do you work with? What kind of formatters do, do I need? And think about that. And then you want to pick a project management tool if you don't already have one, ideally with a Kanban board. Again, I recommend ClickUp, but you can use whatever. Then you want to update the new project SOP that I just shared with you for your development workflow. And then you wanna test the whole system with a demo project ensuring all instructions in the SOPs, the integrations and the automations work. So that's why we have the demo project, not only to show this to you and explain how it works, but also to test things. I'm constantly trying out new things within ClickUp, seeing if they make sense for our development workflow. And this is just kind of like our sandbox, our playground. So those are the four action items that you now have to work through to set up your own development system. It's going to be a lot. This is going to take some time, but this is also going to be really exciting. And you can't even imagine how much time I put into research, testing, and building this out over the years to, to streamline my development workflow. Because really, as a freelancer, the faster and the more effective you can work mean essentially the more you can earn. And I also actually love this. I love building out automations. I love tinkering with these new tools. Um, and to this day, this is really the system that works for us right now at Data Lumina. It's still quite simple, although there are many like uh, bolt, nuts and bolts that you can tweak with. It's still, if you look at a high level, pretty simple and very easy to maintain. It's what works for us right now. And hopefully I've inspired you to maybe copy this system or at least come up with your own development system. So you'll have a consistent way to approach your freelance projects, which will ultimately really, really benefit you in the long run and will ultimately help you to make a lot more money. So that's it for this one that wraps up this module. And then I'll see you in the next one.